Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bob Whitmer, class of 59, uh, Chairman Emeritus of the Board of Trustees, and it's uh, my uh, pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Ed Hagem, our current chair, who we worked very hard over the past weekend. He not only chaired the board meetings, but also uh, attended eight separate graduation ceremonies, and so <laughs> we, we thought he could go back home to New York City. But on his behalf and on behalf of the other uh, trustees, I would like to welcome you. And in fact, given the, the, we've got different locations around here, but I would like those trustees and life trustees who are with us, please to stand and join me in recognizing the contributions that they make to the university and to our community. Thank you. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce someone who every year needs less and less of an introduction. But uh, uh, let permit me a few observations, if I, if I may. Uh, this, we are coming up on the, the end of the fifth year of Joel Seligman's presidency at the university. And to look back at, uh, at those five years, I have said before uh, that leadership counts. And when you look at what we have been able to accomplish in those five years, we have built uh, many uh, superb facilities. Uh, you know, quickly, we've got uh, the Gergen Hall for biomedical engineering and optics, the Wilmot Cancer Center, additions to our laser uh, lab, uh, new student health services building, Kodak Hall at Eastman Theater with the help of Eastman Kodak, our state representatives and many uh, people within the community, including Betty Strassenberg and others. But I will tell you, without Joel's leadership, that would not have occurred. Uh, we, we have We have partnered with private developers and have a new ambulatory surgical center. We have 400 apartments across the river that the students are clamoring for. Uh, we have uh, uh, developed Brooks Landing, which for not just years, decades, we've been trying to, to do, and it's, it's being done now. We're uh, completing a new clinical translational, uh, uh, clinical translational services building, science building, and we're going to be adding beds at uh, the medical center, and and uh, we expect Mount Hope uh, Campus Town is going to start to to develop. And all of that, we can look at the bricks and mortars. We can look at the statistics. We can also, if you will, with me, recall a year ago when we were in the depth of the greatest recession since uh, the Great Depression. And people were frightened, they were scared. We were also all in shock at the tragic accident that Brad Burke had uh, <coughs> endured. And because of the stead steady leadership of this organization, we look at ourselves now, with Brad Burke back as CEO of the Medical Center, a, a truly an inspirational recovery. We look at the health of this university of ours, which compared with our peers, we have actually gained ground in, in comparison uh, to our peers. And that was done because our leadership did not panic. Uh, the, uh, and led by example. We needed to control our expenses. We froze most of the salaries of those $40,000 and above, including the president froze his own salary in addition to the 10% of his base salary that he gives back to the university every, every year he contributed another $100,000 to this university of ours. He, found, he funded 
a new community service award that we gave just last month to those members of the staff who work with community organizations that, that uh, uh, enhance the bond between this university and our community. He has earned in every sense the, the uh, conclusion that his leadership, his presidency is outstanding, it is extraordinary. And it is my honor and pleasure to invite to the podium for his report the visionary, the inspirational leader of the university, a good friend of many of us here, the 10th president of the University of Rochester, Joel Seligman. <clears throat> As I complete my fifth year here, Bob's concluding note about friendship resonates all the more with me. Bob was the chair of the Presidential Search Committee that eventuated in my coming here. I met him for the first time in the fall of 2004, and I've rarely been so inspired by a university board leader as I was by Bob. Um, from my first conversations, I wanted to be here. I have never regretted coming here. This is a great community, and it's great in part because of the fabulous people who participate and support so many institutions throughout the community. You'll forgive me if I have a partiality for Bob. Uh, he is, as he said, a dear friend, and he's someone whose own generosity of spirit and commitment to the community deserves to be recognized. And can you join me, perhaps, in that? As Bob intimated, during the past year, we've had much to celebrate. And I want to particularly focus, since we are at the Memorial Art Gallery, on two magnificent current exhibitions, one featuring a selection of Rochester and Albert Paley's sculptures and drawings, and the other showcasing 34 of Rembrandt's rare master etchings from the collection of Tobia and Dr. Morton Mower. The MAG for close to 100 years has played a vital role in the Rochester community, linking the university to our community. And I'm also delighted that apparently Albert Paley is here tonight and will be autographing a book about his magnificent art. Is. <laughs> Welcome, Albert. <laughs> In 2009, we dedicated the Edmund A. Hagem School of Engineering and Applied Sciences in a ceremony that featured an address by Chuck Vest, the MIT President Emeritus and current president of the National Academy of Engineering. We had a fabulous Meliora weekend, including a keynote address by our graduate, Steve Chu, Secretary of Energy and Nobel Laureate, and the dedication of the George Eastman statue in our central quadrangle. On October 8th, as Bob uh, recounted, we opened the renovated Kodak Hall at Eastman Theater with a gala, sold out performance by the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra featuring Eastman School of Music Dean Doug Lowry's original composition, Geo, in honor of George Eastman. And my vision is such that I can also recognize Doug Lowry is here tonight. <laughs> In December 2009, we dedicated the new Del Monte Neuromedicine Institute, supported by the second largest contribution in the medical center's history from Ernie and Thelma Del Monte. In December, we dedicated the David and Eileen Flaum Eye Institute, with its Adeline P. Lutz Pavilion, named in honor of Adeline's $6 million commitment to the institute. Earlier in June, we broke ground for the Clinical and Translational Science Building, which is scheduled to be completed in the first half of 2011. In July, we dedicated a new 80,000 square foot 
Ambulatory Surgery Center, which added 10 new operating rooms to Strong Memorial Hospital's 33 operating rooms. In September 2009, we celebrated the expansion and renovation of the Wolk Emergency Department at Highland Hospital. In October, the Board of Trustees approved resolutions to initiate a, well, a three-floor addition to the James P. Wilmot Cancer Center that will add 45 much-needed beds and will be the first step in a process that will lead to the construction of a new hospital tower to modernize Strong Memorial Hospital. Undergraduate applications this year broke another record, rising to 12,697 and conceivably more for next year's class. University research scientists continue to report extraordinary results. We finished the 2009 federal fiscal year of our aggregate government and private sponsored research funds, equaling 351 million, in addition to $45 million funds being received from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act stimulus funding through April of 2010. For me, in many ways, by far the highlight of the past academic year was the return of Brad Burke as the Chief Executive Officer of the Medical Center on March 1, 2010, some nine months after he experienced a severe spinal cord injury. Brad's return is a remarkable story of determination, fortitude, and courage. I salute him. On March 1, 2010, Mark Taubman began his tenure as Dean of the School of Medicine and Dentistry after exceptional service as acting chief executive officer during Brad's rehabilitation. We are blessed to have two extraordinary leaders at the helm of the Medical Center, along with Steve Goldstein and a great leadership team. And again, my eyesight is now capable of seeing all the way to the second row, and Mark Taubman is here. Maybe Mark. <laughs> This was a year of stellar faculty achievements. In September 2009, Professor of Mechanical Engineering Riccardo Vetti won the prestigious Edward Teller Award for his fusion research. In November, Associate Professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences Carmela Garcion received the 2009 New York Academy of Sciences Blavatnik Award for her research that has helped redefine geologists understanding of the rate at which mountain ranges form. Ruth Lawrence, professor of pediatrics and obstetrics and gynecology, was awarded the 2009 Martha May Elliott Award by the American Public Health Association for her tireless efforts to improve women and children's health. Biology professors Vera Gorbanova and Andrei Solunov won the Cozzarelli Prize for their pioneering research in the causes of near total cancer resistance in naked mole rats. As I made clear last year, by far my favorite rodent uh, <laughs> of the early 21st century. In recognition of his outstanding scientific career, Richard Eisenberg, the Tracy H. Harris Professor of Chemistry, was elected to both the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences to be elected to one academy is an extraordinary achievement. To be elected to two in the same year is almost mind-boggling. It's, it's so impressive. Alan Orr, who I talked about last year, is the winner of the Darwin Wallace Award for his work on evolutionary biology. This year was also elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. George Eastman Professor Eliza, or Elissa, excuse me, Newport in Brain and Cognitive Sciences and Linguistics was elected to the American Philosophical Society. Alyssa has done absolutely path-breaking work in cognitive sciences and psycholinguistics. In all, Eastman faculty and alumni received 10 Grammy nominations this year, and three alumni won Grammys, Anthony Dean Griffey for Best Classical Album and Best Choral Performance, Renee Fleming for Best Classical Vocal Performance, and Bill Cunliffe for best instrumental arrangement for a revival of West Side Story. The university has become an economic bulwark of the Rochester community. As of December 31, 2009, 
we were the largest employer in Rochester with 19,610 full-time equivalent jobs, having added 167 new jobs last year during a recession. When combined with affiliates, the University of Rochester was responsible for approximately 47,000 direct and indirect jobs in our region, or approximately 8.8% of the total Rochester workforce in the greater community. We added $2.3 billion in wages for the region and generated $141 million in sale taxes, personal income tax, and local property tax to the Rochester region and the New York State, according to the Center for Governmental Research. Now, there's an important story underlying these data. Over the past decades, our state has evolved increasingly to a knowledge-based economy in which by 2009, five of the largest 10 employers in New York either are universities, health centers, or both. Indeed, the University of Rochester today is the sixth largest employer in the state. A key to the university's growth has been our focus on innovation. During the past eight years, we have ranked as one of the top 10 universities in the country in terms of patent royalties, an extraordinary tribute to the talents of our faculty. As I said, I'm now completing my fifth year at the university, and I've truly enjoyed this fabulous community participating in the leadership of a university that continues to make substantial progress. Tonight I want to focus on what for me has been the greatest pleasure of the last five years, indeed the greatest pleasure of my 33 years as an academic, are absolutely amazing students. Nothing for me is more fun than teaching. For three of the last four years, I've taught an undergraduate class in the United States Supreme Court in constitutional law, popularly known as Greatest Hits of the Supremes. <laughs> <laughs> I particularly enjoy participating in a seminar that begins with students learning literally what a law case is and concludes with students proposing, debating, and voting upon amendments to the Constitution. And, and this year, I'm happy to report that we actually achieved two-thirds votes in favor of three separate amendments to the Constitution. <laughs> By far the record in the class. Now, I teach about 20 undergraduates in the seminar. There are more than 9,900 students at our university. All are fascinating. Let me tell you some of their stories. Not many students these days, let alone a young man, arrive on campus with a sewing machine. But this is exactly what senior Brian McMillan did his freshman year. In the years that followed, you could have run into him sewing tarps, often into the late night hours, in the basement of the Hauptman Engineering Building or one of the dining halls on campus. Now at age 22, Brian is the president and owner of a profitable company, Outdoor Equipment Supplier. He designs and manufactures ultra-lightweight, durable camping tarps for backpackers who don't want to carry a full ten tent with them but need protection from the rain, wind, and snow. Brian has woven his business interest into his mechanical engineering education at the Hagem School. Mononita Noor, a freshman biomedical engineering major, lived in two foreign countries before coming to the University of Rochester. She was born in Bangladesh and speaks fluent Bengali. Mononita is a Hagem scholar, and she's interested in a field of biomechanics because it allows her to apply a subject that she loves, physics, to the design of devices like prosthetics and joint replacements that have the power to improve people's lives in a very tangible way. Zach Kimball is an award-winning actor on our campus, having won the 2009 Charles I. Keelan Memorial Award in theater for outstanding acting and scholarship. Zach is not a theater major, but his interest in theater led him to our international program. He has performed in several productions, including King Lear, The Lower Depths, Curse of the Starving Class, You Can't Take It With You, and The Hairy Dutchman. He also redesigned the website for Todd Theater after creating and implementing the interface from scratch. In typical Rochester student fashion, Zach graduated this spring with degrees in economics and political science and is headed to Harvard Law School. Junior. Nicholas Wiggins was the star of our recent George Eastman Circle dinner in New York City. 
He's also an economics major in the college, a vocal performance major studying opera at Eastman School, and for his first two years, a defensive lineman on our football team. <laughs> Nick is also treasurer of the Yellow Jackets, our beloved student a cappella ensemble. Nick describes the freedom he's found at Rochester to explore such diverse interests, quote, empowering. In November, the University of Rochester became the first school in six years to beat MIT in the regional finals of the oldest, largest, and most prestigious computer programming competition in the world, the so-called Battle of the Brains. <laughs> Ian Christopher, Dennis Hu, Xi Jing Tang, and their advisor, Daniel Stefanovich, won the Northwestern North American region in the Association of Computing Machinery's International Collegiate Programming Contest. This winter, they flew to Harbin, China, for the international finals and came home with an honorable mention. Next time someone says, pass the pig to you, keep in mind that this admonition is intended to help your savings account grow. Pass the Pig was the slogan created by a team of Rochester students that was one of only two teams from the United States and 22 teams worldwide to be named global winners in the 2009 Stanford Global Innovations Tournament. The five-member member team, including undergraduates Jennifer Berger, Elena Stover, Eric Wish, Eva Z, and graduate student Justin Peskowski, um, were triumphant. They were one of nearly 1,000 teams that were asked to come up with creative ideas on how to, quote, make saving money fun, end quote, and then convey their ideas through short vi videos posted to YouTube. Senior Jim Bristow is an example of the scholar athlete we celebrate at Rochester. The senior from Devon, England is the first Rochester squash player to be named an All-American four years in a row. He's the only senior squash player in the country this year to earn the honor each year of his college career. Jim represents one of the extraordinary aspects of Rochester's squash program, which this winter finished in the national championships. It's the second year in a row that Rochester finished among the top four teams in the country. The Rochester squash team, coached by Martin Heath, a native of Scotland, by the way, have put Rochester's name in the upper echelons of squash, along with Trinity, Harvard, and Yale. Melissa Allwart helped lead the Rochester women's basketball team to the NCAA Division III Final Four in Bloomington, Illinois. And by the way, if you're ever in Bloomington, Illinois, and you want a hotel suite as large as Yankee Stadium for just $89, Talk to me, I can help. <laughs> Back to Melissa. On the court, Melissa was the team's leading scorer who averaged nearly 13 points a game, shot 42% beyond the three-point line, and was named the MVP of two tournaments. Off the court, Melissa is a health and society major with plans to pursue a career in health care. This season, she led a team that turned out to be the Cinderella story of the national tournament, the only unranked team in the country to reach the Final Four. The Yellow Jacket women's basketball team def defeated some of the top teams in the country on their way to a fourth place finish. Sarah Nymanis was in her junior year as a biomedical engineering major, getting ready for medical school, when she was captivated by an idea. Why does music evoke such strong emotions in people? How does the brain interpret music and language? At many universities, that would have been the end of the matter. In order to ensure that students finish their degrees and graduate, many colleges offer students little flexibility to follow their natural curiosity about an intriguing question. Not at Rochester. For 21 years, we've had a program known as Take Five that empowers students like Sarah to spend a tuition-free year after graduation exploring courses they were unable to take while working towards a degree. After finishing her degree in biomedical engineering, Sarah spent an additional year combining courses in linguistics and brain and cognitive sciences, along with courses at the Eastman School of Music. 
to delve deeply into questions about music, language, and cognition that she believes will be of enormous value to her as a scholar and scientist. Our College of Arts, Science, and Engineering is not limited to undergraduates, but also includes extraordinary graduate students. Leila Narako, a PhD student at Rochester and native of Hawaii, has a BA in English Literature and Medieval and Renaissance Studies from the College of William and Mary. After college, she taught high school for a year before deciding to continue at Rochester. Kate is interested in the Crusades and their influence on literature. She worked on a number of Crusades-related projects in the Robbins Library, including the creation of the Crusades Project, a forthcoming electronic resource attached to the Camelot Project and centering on representations of the Crusades in Western Europe and American literature. Kate also went to Iceland, presumably before the most recent <laughs> volcano eruptions, to study Old Icelandic so that she could prepare an edition of an Old Icelandic saga that describes a Viking participating in the Crusades entitled Magnus Sauna Saga, a critical edition, which soon will be published. Sarah Bowman, a fifth-year graduate student who was also an English major as an undergraduate, decided to return to call school and, like so many English majors, study chemistry after <laughs> discovering <laughs> that science is her true calling. Sarah is now part of a research team studying how proteins transport energy throughout the body. These proteins are of intense interest because they are involved in all metabolism, from respiration to aging. In particular, Sarah has been developing new nuclear magnetic resonance probes to aid in these investigations. She was selected to be a student participating in the 59th meeting of Nobel laureates and young researchers recently in Lindau, Germany. At that meeting, she was chosen to be the young researcher's representative to give the closing statement. The recipient of the Edward Peck Curtis Teaching Award, Sarah hopes to pursue a university teaching career. Phil Brune conducts research in archaeology, engineering, and history. His work involves testing the mortar used in ancient Rome in order to explore how the ancient Roman concrete buildings work as structures. Although he has a small collection of 2,000-year-old concrete, he's refabricating concrete using the original Roman recipe. The work requires him to figure out some of the original recipe's, quote, missing ingredients, namely how much water is necessary. Phil jokes that although he hasn't tested it yet, he thinks that it's a high-quality mortar he's developing. He notes with humor that if his research doesn't pan out, he can always become a mason. Trained in classical ballet, he also has two internationally certified sailing licenses and has raced several times out of the Genesee Yacht Club. Abby Tippy, a fourth-year PhD student, earned first place for her team's plan for a business called Custom Eyes that would develop contact lenses that correct higher-order aberrations. She and her team won first place in the Mark Ain Business Model Competition administered through the Simon School. Actively involved serving in the community, both in Rochester and abroad, Abby was chosen as one of 10 graduate students from across the country to participate in a National Science Foundation winter school on nanotechnology in Mumbai, India, and surrounding rural communities last December. Our Eastman School of Music is home both to undergraduate and graduate students. Catherine Branch is a graduate student who has never let the experience of having cerebral palsy slow her down. In the sixth grade, she wanted to play the cello. The instrument was too large to handle without falling over, so her parents bought her a flute. After graduating from Rice and receiving a grant, Catherine commissioned new works and embarked on a year-long world tour. At Eastman, Catherine is a master's degree student who, in addition to taking music and performance, courses is enrolled in the arts leadership program. She's contributing to building audience connections through a concert series she's called Music of Difference. For the first performance, she's putting together a multimedia event with other Eastman musicians and an artist designer, which will be presented in Rochester this month. Michaela 
Eremizova and Oaro Duarte Lopez, our award-winning composers and PhD candidates at Eastman. Each has a background collaborating with filmmakers, and the husband and wife couple resurrected a film scoring course at Eastman. They consulted with Emmy Award-winning composer and Eastman alum Jeff Beal on the course, offering it for the first time in the 2008-2009 academic year. In 2009, their chamber work, Car Crash Opera, was one of only eight out of 80 submissions to be showcased in New York City's opera acclaimed Vox Festival. Both received a 2009-2010 ASCAP, ASCAP Plus Award, a special award that recognizes early and mid-career composers for their bodies of work. As a doctoral student of voice at Eastman, Quinn Patrick juggles a busy professional performance and teaching schedule. She's a mezzo-soprano who has performed with such companies as Glimmerglass, Mercury Opera, and Jacksonville Lyric Opera in concert with the Buffalo Philharmonic, Syracuse Symphony, the Jacksonville Symphony, the Boulder Philharmonic, and she has appeared in Lincoln Center and Carnegie Hall. As a teacher, Quinn gives individual voice lessons to 19 students from Eastman and River Campus each week. She's a lecturer of voice at Nazareth College, and as if that schedule wasn't enough, Quinn is a triathlete who has completed two marathons, three half marathons, two half Ironman competitions, sprint distance triathlons, and several 5K and 10K runs. <laughs> this fall, Quinn will be teaching in a tenure track position at Texas Tech University, focusing on voice. The Red Line Saxophone Quartet, which includes Eastman students Brandon Keyes, Kagon, Quinn Lewis, and Douglas O'Connor, has won six national chamber music competitions since the four first began playing in spring 2008. Red Line memorably made their orchestral debut alongside heralded saxophonist Branford Marsalis and the Alexandria Symphony Orchestra. When Marsalis appeared in Rochester last fall in a benefit concert, he was quoted in the Democrat and Chronicle as saying about Red Lion, man, those guys can play. <laughs> Eastman master's degree student and double bass player Liz Hannon, graduate in 2006, is bringing the joys of stringed music to a new generation of students in Rochester. For the past dozen years, the Eastman School has had a special relationship with the Enrique Ferme School No. 17 in the Rochester City School District. Eastman students go to the school to mentor and coach the school's string students during their practice time. Starting as a music teacher in the school where she received her bachelor's degree in 2006, Liz now runs the string program. Under her leadership, the program has grown from about 20 string players in grades three through six to more than 70. Liz has been a steady presence at the school for four years, leading music and helping develop routines for all students in the school. We are proud that our outstanding students are also in our professional schools. Romeo Galang graduated this year from the School of Medicine and Dentistry and soon will be a resident in obstetrics and gynecology. 2003 graduate of this university with a bachelor's degree in health and society. He earned a master's in public health at Tulane University where he grew up. Romeo was a volunteer in the lowest, lower ninth ward after Hurricane Katrina, working with a team that recovered personal items from flooded homes and conducted community health outreach. Throughout his four years at the School of Medicine and Dentistry, Romeo volunteered with the UR Well program at the St. Joseph's Community Center in Rochester, which provides free health care to the poor and uninsured. Brent Gill, who has worked as a professional audiologist since 1997, decided to change careers and came to the Eastman Institute for Oral Health to study pediatric dentistry. Brent is the father of six children. He believes his role as a parent will make him a better dentist. <laughs> Having, um, as he puts it, six kids at home in different stages of development is like overseeing, quote, a kid's laboratory. <laughs> this allows him to speak the language of worried parents who, in Brent's words, quote, want to be informed and reassured that things will be okay, end quote. 
Brent views dentistry as a profession that will allow him to work closely with patients through the entire process, from diagnosis to recovery, a prospect that he finds very rewarding. In the spring of 2002, when she was a student at Florida International University in Miami, Ana Goyos attended a series of lectures given by Nicholas Cohen, then a professor of microbiology and immunology at the School of Medicine and Dentistry. Cohen, who received his doctorate in 1966 from Rochester and is now Professor Emeritus, focused his research and his talks on evolutionary and developmental immunology. The encounter started Goyos, the daughter of political refugees who emigrated from Cuba, on the road to Rochester in a PhD in immunology. Anna investigates, quote, recognition events, how a body can or can't recognize potential cancer cells and what cells and molecules mediate the recognition, end quote. This interest dates from the death of her mother in 1996 from Hodgkin's lymphoma. This spring, Anna accepted a postdoctoral position in a lab at Stanford University, where she will investigate the biology, genetics, and evolution of major histocompatibility complex class I molecules, natural killer cell receptors, and other immune system molecules. Our commitment to professional education is also evident in our School of Nursing and its remarkable accelerated degree program, often used by students to pursue a second career. For more than 30 years, Bill Clark, who's also with us, was a distinguished educator and school administrator. After retiring as an assistant school superintendent and relocating from Long Island to Rochester to be near his family, he decided his working years weren't quite behind him. He began our accelerated nursing program in May 2009. He's also an online graduate professor for Stony Brook University and serves on a diocesan committee preparing couples for marriage, learning sign language to help prepare couples who are part of the deaf community. Recently, he and his wife have been volunteering at Strong Memorial Hospital on Sundays, bringing communion to those patients unable to attend Mass. Bill graduated May 14th, and at 62, he looks forward to starting his nursing career as a hospice nurse. When Leron Nelson lost his grandfather and a friend to HIV, many around him accepted their deaths as a part of life. Leron could not. He became determined to effect change. He enrolled in what was then the School of Nursing's traditional baccalaureate program and completed the master's portion of the school's MHD, PhD program in 2004. Last July, he defended his dissertation, and on May 15th, he became the first African-American man to receive a PhD from our nursing school. Never, never forgetting what inspired him to enter nursing as a student, Laurent worked on NIH-funded projects involving HIV prevention interventions with high-risk young urban and minority women. He hopes to educate a new generation of nurses, continue his research, and contribute at the public health policy level in order to positively affect people's lives. Our Warner School of Education also is making a difference in a national community. <laughs> Kathy Canicio, a doctoral student at Warner, serves as the head science curriculum advisor for Sesame Workshop, the nonprofit educational organization behind Sesame Street. As the ever popular children's show celebrated its 40th anniversary, it took on a new focus, teaching young children about science through the world around them. Canicio, a classroom teacher and preschool curriculum specialist, spends most of her time working closely with the team's writers and producers to review Sesame Street scripts, evaluating science for accuracy, and making sure the presentation is developmentally appropriate for the show's audience. Child advocate Ralph Spezio is pursuing his doctoral degree in educational administration while working full-time in the Medical Center's Department of Community and Preventive Medicine. Ralph first discovered in 1999 that something was wrong with the health of our children in the Rochester Elementary School, where he was principal. Since 1999, when Ralph learned that the three to five-year-olds in the school where he was principal had blood lead levels 10 times the national average, he has worked to prevent and treat child lead poisoning, and he's now doing his dissertation research on the impact existing computer software has on the reading scores of lead-poisoned children. 
He is co-founder of and currently helps lead the community-based coalition to prevent lead poisoning, which received the 2009 Environmental Justice Achievement Award from the Environmental Protection Agency. Within a few months, Simon School Finance MBA students Siddharth Lidsaraya, Gajinder Grewal, and Aparav Mahajan will have created a solar power plant in their home country of India. The three students arrived at the Simon School with backgrounds in banking and investment management, and they embraced the culture of entrepreneurism at Simon. Along with Simon's prestigious, I'm sorry, rigorous MBA, and by the way, also prestigious, <laughs> the three have completed a business plan for the solar power plant, secured funding for it, and helped found the vendors they need to make the plant a reality. Currently, the project is pending government approvals. Siddharth, Rajinder, and Afarov are betting that solar power will be a key in meeting India's growing energy needs. Sanghi Yu is breaking new paths for her employer, Korea Electric Power Corporation in South Korea. An assistant manager in the company's treasury department, Sanghi Yu is a certified public accountant who oversees financial statements representing $30 billion in sales. She earned the company CEO's award for her work to bring innovative training programs to the company. She is the first woman whom Korean Electric Power has ever sponsored to study for an MBA, and she is earning her degree at our Simon School. Not many years ago, and in most programs, she would have been outnumbered substantially by her male classmates. That's not the case at Simon, thanks to a leadership effort to bring more women into business education earlier in their careers. At Simon, 30% of our full-time student body is female, and in the executive MBA program, her program, 37% of our class is female. Both are well above national averages. In addition, Simon has more international students than any other MBA program in the top 50. Sung Yi has also been part of an international stage in a stunningly different sense. She performed Korean traditional dancing for the opening ceremonies of the 1988 Olympic Games in Seoul. On April 8th of this year, we did something I've long looked forward to. We had our first ever all-university celebration of our scholarship recipients and our scholarship supporters. This was a very special occasion in which we saluted the wonderful support given to our great students and focused on the insoluble bonds that joined generations of Rochesterians. Our chair at Hagem and trustee Gwen Green began the evening by recalling how much scholarship support had meant to them in attending Rochester and how their chance to study here had been the foundation of their extraordinarily successful lives. Ed has now provided support for more than 100 scholarship recipients, the University of Rochester and elsewhere. Emily Berkman, a medical student, spoke that night. She's the recipient of the Mac Everett Scholarship and sat with Mac at the dinner when she first met, and I should say, Dr. Mac Everts. He was chief executive officer of the medical center and long renowned as one of this nation's most innovative orthopedic surgeons. Emily recalled meeting Dr. Everts during an autopsy when he exclaimed with pure delight that the decedent had a knee replacement. Emily has decided to go into pediatrics when she graduates, a de decision she says was inspired by her Everett Scholarship. Next year, she plans to travel to Vietnam to assist with cleft lip and palate surgeries for children in need. Highlight of the scholarship dinner was hearing Andre Washington speak and perform on the flute. Andre, who just graduated from Eastman last week, spoke movingly of his love for music and how he transformed his life. When he was 15, Andre heard a recording of Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony and became determined to learn to play the flute. Initially, he was self-taught. Soon, his astonishing talent was recognized first by the Merritt School of Music in Chicago and in 2006 by Eastman. In 2009, he was chosen to be principal flutist of the Oberlin in Italy Opera Festival and today is in Paris to begin studies at the École Normale de Musique de Paris as a Fulbright Scholar. 
this would not have been possible but for the support of alumni and friends that provided the means for study at Eastman on scholarship. For me, there was one other highlight of a fabulous evening. Before dinner, during the reception, I met Lydia Zoto, who graduated a few de days ago as a harp student at Eastman. Her name tag identified her as 10E, meaning an Eastman graduate this year. I asked her what she planned to do after she graduated, and sort of in my mind, I could figure out the possibilities. She might perform, teach, go to graduate school. Lydia surprised me by explaining she intended to earn an M, uh, excuse me, uh, an MBA, then an MD, and go into hospital administration. <laughs> I was a little startled, I have to confess, by this answer. And I turned to a young woman standing next to her whose name tag also said 10E, Eastman graduate. And I said, um, well, um, do, do, do you intend also to go into hospital administration? Um, this student visibly stiffened at my question and said, certainly not. I'm going to law school. <laughs> I hope I've given you some glimpse of why our students are the most fascinating, most rewarding, most inspiring part of my job in many respects. I love this university, but the chance to spend time with them, I think, does more than anything else to keep you young. Very proud to be associated with a student, with a university that has students as amazing as those I've talked about tonight. And if I can highlight one point more than anything else, what is ultimately the most inspiring part of being here is we have close to 9,900 others. Thank you very much.